I uh, grew up in Cuba under a very oppressive military dictatorship, <clears throat> so I know what it is to live under oppression. And I'll tell you what, I had to come to America to find freedom. And that question that I asked Ted dozens of times, when I lost my freedom in Cuba, I had a place to come to. If we lose our freedoms here, where are we going to go? And the reality is there is no place to go. And this is why this, is, this thing that I'm going to talk about you tonight is so important. Because America is at a crossroads, and it is up to us. The Word of God tells us, oops, what happened here? Oh, i got to turn it on. It doesn't work if it's not on. How about that? <laughs> First Corinthians 3.11 says, For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, America is a very, very unique country. When those pilgrims came to America, at the Mayflower, before they got off the boat, they penned a document. It was called the Mayflower Compact. And it began by stating their purpose for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That was their stated purpose. Do you realize America is the only country on the face of the earth established as a Christian country from the very century. So it states their purpose for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. It continues. In the presence of God, we covenant and combine ourselves together to form a civic body politic. In other words, some form of government. Why? For our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. What are the ends aforesaid? The glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. What a unique heritage. What a wonderful heritage. I don't know about you, I love this country with a passion. And you need to also. Because if we lose America, there ain't no place to go. I want to talk to you about the foundation of Jesus Christ, the foundation upon which this country was built. Of course, that foundation begins with a relationship with the living God, when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And of course, when that happens, you have the promise and the hope of eternal life. And then the fruit of the Spirit begins to manifest in your life. Love, joy, peace, and the rest of it. And then God gives you a purpose in life. You no longer walk aimlessly in life. God gives you a purpose, a direction in life. And we walk by what is called a Judeo-Christian ethic. We walk by the principles established in the Word of God. The net result of that is that we begin to live a life of contribution. If there is one statement that would characterize a Christian more than anything else, is that we live lives of contribution. There is no any higher calling in the Christian life than for you to invest your life into the lives of others. The net result of that it's a free society with respect for the individual. However, the Bible also says in Psalms 11.3, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then in Hosea 4.7, Hosea says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Unfortunately, the world has set up all their foundations. I want to talk to you about two that are very interrelated. Atheism and secular humanism. And they are different, but they are very intertwined. And of course, atheists is governed by instincts, because there is no God. And of course, there are no moral absolutes. If there is not right and wrong, there are no moral absolutes. And this is where situational ethics comes. 
which unfortunately is now being taught in every public school in America. Basically, situational ethics tells you there is no right or wrong, nothing is black and white, everything is gray, and it all depends on the circumstances. Well, actually, that's not what the Word of God says. But then, of course, without God, without anything beyond this life, life has no value. And if life has no value, what are you going to have? You're going to have abortion on the man. You're going to have all kinds of other things. You're going to have rampant immorality and sexual abuse because life is meaningless. And ultimately, you are without hope. Without hope in this world. You know, John Milne in his book, uh, Paradise Lost, said men live lives of quiet desperation. That is the life of someone that has no relationship with the living God. Now let's look at the other side, secular humanism. Well, secular humanism basically says, you are your own God. And of course, that has unfortunately crept into the churches of America. And we got many churches in America where secular humanism has crept in and they are preaching the social gospel. In other words, they are trying to tickle men's ears, okay, deluding the gospel. And of course, along with that, you have liberation theology, which is basically uh, very intertwined with Marxism and some Christian theology mixed with Marxism. It was born in Nicaragua, during the communists in Nicaragua, and then it spread everywhere. As a matter of fact, our past president spent many years in a liberation <coughs> theology church. And then, of course, it leads to class warfare, because basically what happens is you're dealing under collectivism. And collectivism basically makes everybody be divided into a series of separate groups. It makes every group seem like a victim, which needs a handout of society, so that leaves you to a life of dependency. Because ultimately, that leads to socialism, and ultimately to communism. That is the, the path upon which we are seeing this country moving. Now, it didn't start last year. It didn't start with Obama. Actually, the acceleration of the destruction of our Judeo-Christian values started in 1933 <coughs> with the signing of a document in America called the Humanist Manifesto. The Humanist Manifesto was modeled after an earlier document <coughs> called the Communist Manifesto. Both of these documents are almost identical. As a matter of fact, in my book, I have a comparison of these two doc documents, and you can see the tenets of the Humanist Manifesto, and I have the tenets of the Communist Manifesto in the appendix, and they're practically the same. But here's something that may shock you. One of the principal signers of the Humanist Manifesto was a man by the name of Dr. John Dewey. If you're an educator, you know who Dr. John Dewey was. He's considered the father of modern American education. But what you may not know is that in 1928, five years before, John Dewey went to Russia as a special guest of Joseph Stalin. See, Dewey was a Marxist. Dewey came back to America praising the Russian educational system as the greatest educational system in the world. So unfortunately, since 1933, our American public education system has been undergirded by secular humanism and Marxism. Now, I am not speaking against teachers. 
We have many wonderful teachers in America, but they are working under a flawed system, a system that now is controlled by Common Core and a lot of other things that are trying to undermine our Judeo-Christian system and undermine parental direction. As a matter of fact, kids in schools are told today not to let their parents see what they're studying. It is indoctrination what is occurring in our schools. And that's why homeschooling has exploded all across the country. Because too many parents have said, I'm not going to take it anymore. And if you do not have the resources to put your children in a Christian school or in a private school, then you're left with homeschooling if you don't want them to be indoctrinated by secular humanism. Now, how has this polluted our educational system in the last 80 years or so? Look at this quote. The same quote by Joseph Stalin and uh, by Adolf Hitler. <coughs> Give me the children and I will rule the world. And that there is a very, very concerted effort to brainwash our kids. Unfortunately, we've seen the results of that in our universities, that almost 50% of our university students today think that socialism is a better system than capitalism. <coughs> now, a great thing, how many of you are old enough to remember Pogo? The comic strip Pogo? You know the greatest thing Pogo ever said? No. I found the enemy and the enemy is us. It is our fault. It is our fault because especially with families with both husband and wife working, you send your kids to school and you don't even worry about what they're being stuck. I'll tell you something, if you have your child in public school, the very least you have to do is you gotta make sure you know what they're being taught. And you may have to spend a couple of hours trying to deprogram them from the garbage that's been put into their minds. There is an agenda and it's not a good one. Now, as I said, no moral absolutes. You think about it, without a biblical foundation, where is the moral compass? Where is the accountability? The philosophy of the day is if it feels good, do it. And now, unfortunately, and if I step on toes, you'll say, ouch. <laughs> unfortunately, the reaction of the church is to become more like the world. It's just diluting everything to become less relevant. Now, let me just show you the trend <coughs> over the last 50, 60 years. 1962, prayer was removed from all public schools. Anybody here old enough to remember when we prayed in school? Yeah. Well, that became illegal after 1962. There were some teachers that continued to do it, but they were defying the law. <coughs> A year later, 1963, the Bible was removed from all public schools. Now let me ask you a question. This is a very well-versed uh, group, so I expect there will be more that will know the, question, the answer to this question. Do you know who printed the first Bible in America? Congress printed the first Bible in America. Do you know why? So it would become the principal textbook in every primary school, high school, and university in America. And it was so, listen to me well, it was so for over 150 years. So much for separation of church and state. <laughs> and in 1963, nine unelected justices of the Supreme Court banned the Bible from all schools. As a matter of fact, it's an interesting uh, judgment. They said, that if a child read the Bible without an adult interpreting to them, they could become mentally unstable. <laughs> now, it gets worse. 1973, 
Roe v. Wade legalized abortion. Over 60 million babies have been murdered in America through abortion. I know it gets, I'm not through. 2015, 2015, nine unelected <coughs> justices of the Supreme Court decided that God got it wrong. In Genesis chapter one, verse 27, God says, let us create man in our own image. In the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. And then in chapter 2 it says, for that reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cling to his own wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But the Supreme Court decided, no, 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 no. God got it wrong. God is, marriage is anything you want it to be. It could be two men and a horse. As a matter of fact, I'm not extrapolating. In, in England, just a few years ago, a woman married her dog. But it, actually, think about it. With all these things, the church remains <coughs> silent. Their excuse is a political issue. Social gospel. Hide behind the pulpit. Don't make any waves. Now we have something proliferating across America. They're called soggy ordinances. Sexual orientation and gender identity ordinances. This is what are called the bathroom laws. Well, let me tell you something that may shock you. Texas, bright, red, conservative, Bible Belt, Texas. We have over 200 municipalities in Texas where that is the law of the land, that a man can enter a woman's bathroom, including Plano, Texas which passed that ordinance almost two years ago and is still in the books. Over 200 little cities in Texas and big cities where that's the law of the land. Why is that happening? I'll tell you why it's happening. Because way too many people of faith have said, politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear it rule, people mourn. But if the righteous, the people of principle, the people of faith, are not running for office, if the righteous are not even voting, what is left? The wicked electing the wicked. And it becomes our fault. This is why I'm so encouraged. Uh, Bibi and I were at a meeting last night of a club in uh, Collin County who, has who they have already recruited 48 candidates to run for city council, run for mayor, run for school board. All these ordinances are being passed by city councils and by the mayor in those little towns. But we're too busy to get involved while the country is going to hell in a handbasket. We better get involved. If there is one call to action, it's this thing. The only way we can stop this is for us to have people of principle running for city council, running for mayor. You want to change our schools? have people of principle running for school board. It is our fault. Now, you know, we talk about, oh, you need to be salt and light. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Jesus also said, you're the salt of the earth. But you know what we do in too many churches? We come to our churches with our little flashlights. Pointing the light on one another. Boy, are we great about criticizing one another, about gossiping to, for, about one another. 
But you know something? Light is worthless unless you point it to darkness. That's out there in the marketplace. We got to stop just playing church inside the four walls. We need to take the church out there. And by the way, the same is true for synagogues. We got to stop just playing inside the four walls. We got to take our principles out there. Because there are a lot of people in darkness out there. And if you got the light, you got a responsibility. You know, the Word of God says, to whom much is given, much is required. The more revelation you have, the more it is on you to be able to share that to someone else. And so what happens is they become social clubs, deluding the message because what they want to do is they want to look like the world. You look at all these mega churches where you go there and it's basically a show, a Broadway show. It's not worshiping God. He's putting together a show. Entertainment. Yeah. Look like the world with the excuse of attracting the world. The problem is when the world comes, ain't nothing different. You don't impact anybody because it looks just like the world. Now, you know, the Apostle Paul said in the book of Acts, my hands are free from the blood of all men because I have not shown to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. He was referring from, for, uh, to a passage in Ezekiel chapter 3 where God says through the prophet Ezekiel, if you do not warn the wicked of his wicked ways, he will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of your hands. But if you warn the wicked of his wicked ways, and he does not turn from it, he will still die in his iniquity, for you have redeemed your soul. Our responsibility is to warn the wicked. How the wicked responds, that's their problem. That's between them and God. But we have to be preaching the whole counsel of God. And you know what? The whole counsel of God goes between Genesis 1-1 and the end of the book. <laughs> oh, I'm, and let me ask you something. Has the fear of the Lord been replaced? Proverbs 1-7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let me tell you something. Knowledge you can acquire in books. Not wisdom. Wisdom is a divine attribute. It comes only by revelation from God. But the fear of the Lord has been replaced by the fear of not being politically correct. Political correctness is destroying America. Amen. Well, it is about time we become biblically correct instead of politically correct. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Moses is talking to the children of Israel. And he says, I set before you life and death. The, free, the, the blessing and the curse. And so then he said, therefore, choose life. Don't be stupid. Choose life. I mean, it ought to be a simple choice. Life or death. Choose life that both you and your seed may live. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you why we need to be in this fight. It's not about us. We are fighting for the future of our children and our grandchildren. You know, Ronald Reagan, one of the greatest presidents that ever lived, once said, Freedom is not free. Freedom is not passed down from generation to generation in our bloodstream. Every generation has to fight to protect it and defend it. Or 
we may find ourselves in our later years talking to our children and our children's children about what it was like when men were free in America. I don't know about you. I'm not willing to have that conversation. Amen. That's why we need to stand in the gap and we need to fight to preserve our freedoms because they are under attack. Yes. Now, let me just say something. As pastors and as Christian leaders, I'm talking about every one of you who is teaching a Bible study or is teaching a Sunday school class or is teaching even just your kids. You fall in this category. We have a stewardship responsibility. <clears throat> if there is a principle that you find all through scripture, it's a principle of stewardship. And I'm going to talk to you this evening quite a bit about stewardship. We are stewards of this country. You're stewards of your children. You have a responsibility, and the bigger stewardship you got, the more responsibility you have. So we have a stewardship over those people that we are teaching or that are under our spiritual care. Because I'll tell you what, if we face, fail in that responsibility, those people have no direction. They just are scattered and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Why step on toes? You'll say, ouch. <laughs> now, listen, if we don't give them direction, they can go astray listening to all the people. I'll tell you what, there are a lot of voices competing for their attention. They're being bombarded left and right. Let me give you a couple of examples. Media. You talk about a propaganda machine. Secular humanist professors, which are a dime a dozen in every university across the United States, including Christian universities. TV shows and movies. Unscrupulous politicians. I mean, the brainwashing is going on all the time. Proverbs 14.12 and Proverbs 16.25 say exactly the same thing. You know, when God says something once, he said it. If he says it twice, he wants you to pay attention. And he says, there's a way which seems right unto man. But that way is the way of life. It's a way of death. It's a way of death. Now, Jesus said, and this is probably one of the most misunderstood, misapplied, and misquoted scriptures in all the Bible. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Well, let me tell you how the majority of Christians, the majority of the church, the majority of people of principle have interpreted that scripture. They have interpreted as divorce yourself from Caesar. Politics is a dirty business. I don't want any part of it. And you stay sitting in your pew or sitting in your living room watching the idiot box while the country is going to hell in a handbasket. But I'll tell you what, that's not what Jesus said. Let me give you my interpretation of what Jesus said. Jesus was saying, in the realm of the kingdom of God, you have certain responsibilities and you must be faithful to those responsibilities. Similarly, in the realm of the civic society, you also have some <coughs> responsibilities, and you must also be faithful to those responsibilities. We have a responsibility to elect righteous leaders, and we need to assume that stewardship responsibility over this country that God has given us. God set America apart to be a beacon of light. 
Do you realize we are 4% of the population of the world? Do you know that America is responsible for over 80% of all the evangelism of the world? And also, America has been used of God to spread the message of freedom and free enterprise. You look at Israel, surrounded by enemies. There's only one friend that Israel can count upon. And that's America. That's America. You know why? Because Christians are people of the book. We know the book. Genesis 12, 3 is very clear, isn't it, Diane? God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. America has been blessed because America has stood steadfastly with Israel. And that's why we've been blessed. And so we serve a very, very unique place in the purposes of God. And America and Israel are intertwined. Intertwined. And this is not the time and place, but I've spoken at a couple of events about Israel, talking about Ephesians chapter 2 and about our tearing down that wall of partition because we serve the same Jehovah God. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we need to exercise this stewardship responsibility by voting for candidates who support and defend our Judeo-Christian principles upon which this nation was born. Now, look at Genesis 1.28. This is what many people call the Dominion Scripture. But I want us to look at it from a different standpoint. God basically said to Adam, I want you to take, say, subdue, to say, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and take dominion over all my creation. You could call that word dominion, take a stewardship responsibility over all my creation. <coughs> I put you as stewards of all my creation. Look what he told Adam. He said, the Lord took man and put him in the garden, what? To dress it and to keep it. What is that? That's a stewardship responsibility over the garden. <clears throat> Our life is all about stewardship. God expects you to be a steward of what he put upon you. Steward of everything he's given you. Including your children. They're not your children. They're God's children. And you're a steward of those children before God. You have to answer to God for that stewardship. Now, let me, let me just share something with you. You know, I am so... I told you I love this country with a passion. The Constitution of the United States of America. Outside of the Bible is the greatest document that has ever been written in history. You know why? Because it was forged on the knees of the framers. As a matter of fact, let me just digress for a little bit and, and uh, tell you a little story. And you will learn by this story how malign some of the framers have been. You know, when the secular humanists want to talk about the framers, they love to talk about two of them, don't they? You know who they are. Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. Thomas Jefferson. Let me tell you, I don't have time to talk to you about both, but let me tell you about Benjamin Franklin, whom they have called the most ungodly of the most. The, the deist. The Constitutional Convention had been going on for about four weeks. And it was falling apart because those delegates were at each other's necks. It was none other than Benjamin Franklin that addresses the president of the convention 
George Washington. And he says, sir, how is it that we have not once called upon the father of lights to illuminate our understanding? Or have we forgotten when we started our struggle against Great Britain, how we met in this very chamber for prayer, seeking his protection? Sir, those prayers were graciously answered. Or do we believe that we no longer need his assistance? Sir, I have lived a long life. And the longer I live, the more assured I am of this truth, that God governs the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire could be built without his aid? As the Holy Scripture tells us, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I paraphrase. If we proceed to build this without him, we will bear no better than the builders of Babel. He concluded by saying, and again I paraphrase, I beseech you therefore that from now henceforth, before we proceed to our deliberations, we meet in this chamber for prayer, seeking his wisdom and direction. They left the Constitutional Convention under the leadership of Pastor John Witherspoon, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, for prayer and fasting. They came back in a totally different spirit, in a spirit of harmony, on their knees every morning. Seven weeks later, they gave us the greatest document that has ever been written in history, the Constitution of the United States of America. I believe that the Constitution of the United States is a divinely inspired document because it was forged on the knees of the framers. And I'll tell you, you look at the Constitution, you know what the number one source for the Constitution was? The Bible. Number two source, Blackstone's Dictionary of Law, where every definition is based on the Bible. That's why it's lasted two centuries, over two centuries. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Why do we have three branches of government? Isaiah 33, 22, which says, for the Lord is our judge, that's a judicial branch. The Lord is our lawgiver, that's a legislative branch. The Lord is our king, that's the executive branch. That's why we have three branches of government. Comes right out of the word of God. Why are churches tax exempt? Didn't come from the IRS. It comes from Ezra 7.24, which says, I certify to you, touching any of the priests, Levites, singers, porters, ministers of the house, that it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. It comes right out of the word of God. Why do we have the death penalty? It wasn't a whim of somebody. Come straight out of Genesis 9, 6. The first statement concerning government in the Bible. And basically God says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man's shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. See what this does. God is saying life is so precious, so very precious, created in the image of God, that if you take a life, you must pay with your own. What the death penalty does is elevate the value of life. And you see the liberals trying to come out with their little violins to talk against the death penalty. The places where you don't have death penalty, you have a lot higher crime. It works. Now, let's look at what the Word of God has to say uh, in the New Testament about, about, and in the Old Testament, we'll get there too. Look at what it says about elected government officials. It says in Romans 13, 4, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Well, unfortunately, some of the politicians have not read that. 
<laughs> but if thou do what that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. That is the biblical function, according to the word of God, of a political official. Now, not many of them are following this, but it says he, he gives a sword to execute wrath upon those that do evil. So when you vote, you are transferring your authority to that elected official to represent you. Right. He becomes per someone that is supposed to be representing your values. Now, look at 1 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man but for the lawless and disobedient. And then look at 2 Chronicles 19, 5 and 6. It says, And he set judges in the land throughout all, and I put this in white because it's very relevant to today, all the fences cities of Judah, city by city. Did you know that every city in Israel had a wall? And a very high wall? <laughs> Okay? These walls were not Trump's idea. <laughs> Even in the time of Israel. When they came to Jericho, what did they find? A wall. A wall. And the wall had to come down before they could come in. Jerusalem had a big wall all around and all the cities. The famous cities of Judah, city by city. So maybe you need to quote this to these people that don't want the walls. <laughs> you don't have a country without borders. And said to the judges, look what he said, the judges you could say, the political officials, okay? Take heed what you do, for you judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Too many politicians need to understand this, because not too many of them do. They have been placed in a position of authority to exercise the judgment from God, to be a minister of God's righteousness. And now I want to go to Matthew 28, which is what is called the Great Commission. But I can guarantee you that many of you have probably missed this about the Great Commission. Jesus began by saying, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Look at the next three words. Go ye therefore. What does that mean? That means that he is transferring his authority to us. He is transferring his authority unto us to go in his name. First he says, all authority in heaven and in earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore. How do you go ye therefore? Or in his authority. Now, Galatians 6, 7 is what is called the law of the harvest. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And you know something? What you sow is what you're going to reap. If you plant apples, you ain't going to get bananas. <laughs> so, you make sure that you're sowing in good ground because you know something? Your bowl is a seed. It's going to produce a crop. The crop is going to depend upon where you plant that seed. Am I... Am I Getting across. So, look at what Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 is called the parable of the soil. And it talks about four different kinds of soil. You got some, some seed that fell by the wayside. You had some field seed that fell among rocks. You had some seed that fell among the thorns. But, you had some seed that fell on good ground. 
and it produced 30 fold, a 60 fold, and a 100 fold. Your goal is a seed. Be careful where you plant it. Now, you look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. And I'm not going to read it all, but I want you to look at what I, what I, I highlighted there. Hands that shed innocent blood. And as a matter of fact, I want you to look in the other seven, the, the other six, most of them have to deal with the tongue. We do a lot of damage with our tongue. But I want to focus on the shedding of innocent blood. What could be more innocent than the blood of an unborn baby? Look what is happening in America today. Now it goes beyond abortion. We have a, a couple of states now that have said, well, even after the baby is born, the parents have the right to say, well, I don't want it. You can kill that baby. That's murder. That's infanticide. As a matter of fact, on the current law, those people could be prosecuted as murderers. God help us. God says, I hate the shedding of innocent lives. Let me tell you something. If you vote for a candidate who promotes abortion, you become complicit in the murder of over 60 million babies. You now that sounds very hard, but that's exactly the way I see it. You become complicit in the murder of babies, innocent babies. No, it's not a woman's choice. It is a human life. You want to know when life com com commences, when it starts? All you have to do is read Jeremiah 1.5. And God says, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. I think that settles when life began. It is murder. Abortion is murder. Abortion is murder, and this is an issue that we cannot compromise in. Every abortion is the mur murder of an innocent child of God. Amen. Now, Charles Finney was the principal preacher during the Second Great Awakening. I want to sh share with you just a couple of statements that he made in a much longer discourse. He said, if Satan rules the halls of legislation, well, it looks like we're reading this week's newspaper, doesn't it? <laughs> he says the pulpit is responsible for it. Now, lest you say, well, I'm not a preacher. He's not talking to me. We all have a pulpit. It may be the place where you work. It may be the place where you go to school. It may be your extended family. It may be your Sunday school teacher or the place where you teach in school. We all have a pulpit. He said, if Satan rules the halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. Look at the next one. If our politics has become so corrupt that the very foundation of our government is ready to fall away. Are we there today? Yeah. Sure looks that way, doesn't it? But notice that he doesn't blame the politicians. He blames the pulpit. He blames the pastors, the priests, the rabbis. Why? Why is he blaming the pastors, the priests, and the rabbis? Because they're tickling men's and women's ears. Let me tell you, the next statement tells you why he blames them. Look at the next statement. And look at it carefully. He said, let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but lay us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation. You know, the biggest lie that we be fed, and I've heard so many people of faith say it, Politics cannot legislate morality. That is a lie. 
politics legislates morality all the time. What do you think it was when politics legislated prayer out of school? When they legislated the Bible out of school? When they legalized abortion? When they legalized same-sex marriage? Is that not legislating morality? And by the way, let me go back to same-sex marriage because too many people misunderstand what that case was about, all about. It wasn't about same-sex marriage. It really was about the destruction of the traditional family. Because if you destroy the family, you destroy society. And it was about an infringement upon our religious liberties. Now, there was a man that came to America right after the American Revolution from France. His name was Alexis de Tocqueville. And he said, not until I went into the churches of America and saw their pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of its genius and power. And then he made a very sobering statement. He said, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I'm going to repeat, we need to take this really to heart. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. This is where we are today. I mean, God, thank you for your mercy. Because this is where we are today. We are on the verge of seeing the destruction of America. We're seeing rampant immorality across the nation. Civility has gone out the window. We're seeing our values, our Judeo-Christian values, under attack daily. I'm going to repeat it one more time. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I don't know about you, but I am sitting back waiting for it. I'm going to stand in the gap and I'm going to do everything I can to turn around this country. You know, there's a very sobering statement in the book of Ezekiel where God says, I look for one man, one man to stand in the gap that I may withhold judgment and could not find him. What an indictment. But there's much more than one here. And I'll tell you what, each and every one of us needs to say like the prophet Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Hear my Lord, use me. You've got to act like you are the only one standing in the gap. Each and every one of us needs to do that. We have a country to save. Patron, Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany said, freedom in the face, silence in the face of evil, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Look at the next statement. God will not hold us guiltless. You hear what it says? God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Silence is not an option. Now, how long are we going to remain silent? But there's a much more important question, and it is this. Are we going to have to answer to God for our silence? Yes. I'll tell you what, that is also a sovereign question. You know, the Bible says that we will have to render an account for every idle word we have spoken. 
I think the converse is also true. We're going to have to render an account to God for all the words we should have said, but we were too chicken to say it. Yeah. Shout it from the housetops. Look at what Ephesians 4.11 says. Have no fellowship with your unfruitful <coughs> works of darkness, but rather reprove them. There's another translation which I like better that says rather expose them. Proverbs 17.15 says, He who justifies the wicked, or he that condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. He who justifies the wicked. Sometimes we see wickedness, and because that wicked politician is of our political party, we stay mum. Or those that condemn the just, or are we so quick to condemn someone who is doing the right thing, but they're not doing exactly the way you would like to have it done, and we shall act them up and down and destroy them. We better get our act together, because we have a habit of attacking each other and destroying each other. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 6, you have a very interesting passage of scripture. You have these people in Babel trying to build a tower to reach heaven. And in verse 6, God says, they are of one accord. And therefore, anything they set their minds to do, they can accomplish. There is power in unity, even for evil. The next time you see that, Past that phrase is in Acts chapter 1, where it talks about the 120 in the upper room, and it says they were together in one accord. And that's where we saw the outpouring of the rope with the Holy Spirit and the beginning of the church. We better get our act together and get in one accord. We need to realize we are not each other's enemies. Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. I'll tell you what. God has chosen each and every one of us to stand in the gap. To be his representatives for righteousness. We have been given this country as a gift from God. And to whom much is given, much is required. We are stewards of this country. We better exercise that stewardship correctly. I want to leave you with one more verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. And God said, Stand fast therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. And do not entangle yourselves again with a yoke of bondage. There are others that are trying to put us in bondage. And I'll tell you what. Too much blood has been shed to give us our freedom. How many of you remember Braveheart? The movie Braveheart. Do you remember the last word of William Wallace? Before? Freedom! Thank you. God bless you. God bless America. God bless Texas.